one, two, three, four, in their neat black suits and ties, Brian Epstein and his personal assistant, Alistair Taylor, make their way down the 18 steep steps into the sweaty basement on Matthew Street. Brian finds it, he says, as black as a deep grave, dank and damp and smelly. He wishes he hadn't come. Both he and Taylor would prefer to be attending a classical concert at the Philharmonic, but curiosity got the better of them. Four young musicians saunter onto the stage. Brian recognises them from the family record shop he manages. They are the ones who lounge around in the booths, listening to the latest discs and chatting to the girls, with absolutely no intention whatsoever of buying a record. Between songs, the three yobs with guitars start yelling and swearing, turning their backs on the audience and pretending to hit one another. Taylor notices Brian's eyes widen with amazement. Taylor himself is undergoing one of the most shocking experiences of his life. Like someone thumping you, he says, and he's pretty sure that Brian feels the same. After the show, Taylor says, they're just awful. They are awful, agrees Brian, but I also think they're fabulous. Let's just go and say hello. George is the first of the Beatles to spot the man from the record shop approaching. Hello there, he says. What brings Mr. Epstein here? I've, I've been a Beatles fan f probably since way too young. My, my mum's second husband uh, was a Beatles fan and so I kind of inherited all his Beatles albums. So I was listening to the Beatles from, from sort of 10. I can just about remember listening to Beatles when they were around. I remember when Abbey Road came out, and I remember listening to Octopus's Garden and Here Comes the Sun on the Radio, but I've always loved the Beatles. To be honest, if you don't love the Beatles, there's something wrong with you. There will always be people that go, do we need another Beatles book? To which the answer, of course, is yes. Uh, so I would just have read this book anyway. I rushed out and bought it as soon as, as soon as it was around. To those joyless souls who say we don't need another Beatles book, this is not like any other Beatles book. It's not one of those books that's, that tells you what day, you know, here Comes the Sun was recorded and who, what guitar George played and what key it was in and which take they find. It's not that kind of book. It's a very, very different Beatles book. This is pretty much a book about the people that moved into the Beatles orbit, the people whose lives they affected. Famous people and people you've never heard of. Fans, um, dentists, postmen, all the sorts of people who, who just moved in and out of, of that orbit. Because the Beatles just affected everybody. Um, and the book is a fantastic examination of just the, the supernatural cultural effect they had on the world. And it has some stories in it that will leave you gobsmacked. No spoilers, but there is a story about Paul McCartney's postman. And when I read it, I had to put the back book down and, and just breathe heavily for about 10 minutes. It's just an astonishing story. It's full of these weird coincidences and bits of synchronicity. Um, and you have the Beatles interacting with, you know, world leaders, but you also have their interactions with Rolf Harris and Marlena Dietrich and Cliff Richard and bizarre little stories. You find out about the, the, the man who was a Beatle then wasn't a Beatle. The man who was a Beatle for 10 days when Ringo got ill on, a, on an Australian tour. And some of the stories are really sad. Some of the people whose lives they affected, it didn't work out very well. People who were successful before the Beatles came along and as they rose, other people fell. And some of the stories are very tragic, but it is never less than, than compelling. I discovered things in this book that, that I've just been telling people ever since. People who think they know about the Beatles going, well, you don't know the story about Paul McCartney's postman. And I won't tell you what the story is because you know, you, I want readers to find that out. Um, the story about the bizarre coincidence behind the writing of She's Leaving Home, the, the song Paul McCartney wrote, is just enough to just absolutely knock you for six. I think I know pretty much everything there is to know about the Beatles, but there was something on every page in this book that I'd, I'd never come across before. I, I have to agree, I have to agree with Craig Brown. To be Paul McCartney in kind of 64, 65, 66, um, when he was, you know, in the most famous group in the world, he was writing songs that I don't think have, have ever been equaled. And he was also really part of that kind of whole avant-garde scene. You know, there's this real myth amongst Beatles fans that Lennon was the kind of avant-garde one, but it was Paul that actually discovered all that stuff because they were all out living in the country, the rest of them, on country estates, but Paul was living in the heart of London when all sorts of crazy things was happening and, and he was on top of that. Plus he was living with Jane Asher, 
Although he was living with Jane Asher's parents, kind of oddly. Um, <laughs> kind of a strange life, but yeah, you can't argue with being Paul McCartney. This is a book that's full of quirky, odd facts that looks a bit at a story we're all really familiar with in a really different way. We all know the Beatles appeared on The Ed Sullivan Show, but did you know about Marlena Dietrich's bizarre scene-stealing antics while, you know, while they were on the Royal Variety Show? Did you know about the, the, the sad comedy double act whose career was ruined because they were on After the Beatles on Ed Sullivan? It, it just makes you look at things in a, in a completely different way while leaving you in no doubt of the kind of bizarre and, and enormous cultural impact they had all over the world. Do I have a favourite Beatle? Ah, it's Paul. My favourite Beatle is Paul. I know it's much trendy to say John, but Paul, I mean, Paul is a proper musical genius. He just has music coming out of every pore. Yeah, Paul, definitely. The amazing thing about this book is I've recommended it to loads of people and sometimes they say, what is there that's new to tell us about the Beatles? But it's somehow one of the freshest books I've ever read and it makes you see them through a completely different lens. And part of that story is all of these wonderful counterfactuals. So he makes you see if Ringo hadn't been ill as a child, if Paul had passed his Latin exam, um, if John's mum hadn't died. Lots of these little moments, well they weren't so little, but the Beatles would never have happened. So it's a kind of magical book that makes you see so many factors had to come together in order for um, the Beatles to become what they did. I just loved this book. I've read it three times so far. I'm looking forward to rereading it again um, before the final judging meeting. It's funny, it's sad, it's fresh. Um, it's everything that I want from a non-fiction book. It's comforting, it's informative. It just takes you on all these different little journeys. So he's not just writing about the Beatles, he somehow sees that in order to tell the full story of the Beatles, you also need to see they impacted all of these other people around the world, the people that hated them, the people that loved them, the time they met the Queen, the fact that Charles Manson was interested in them. It's an extraordinary book and nobody other than Craig Brown could have written it. The journey the reader can be expected to be taken on uh, I'd say it's pretty amazing because I think the story of the Beatles is one of the great kind of 20th century stories. So almost like a, a novel. First, you get the story of these four working class boys from Liverpool becoming, in the space of a few years, uh, uh, the most famous four people in the world, just about. And changing history I mean, in a bizarre way. That sounds like hyperbole, but... Uh, both Gorbachev and Putin told Paul McCartney when he went to Russia that uh, for them that all youth in the Soviet Union was changed by the Beatles because it gave the Soviet Union a, this idea of freedom. Um, so at the same time that the older generation in the West were kind of sight tutting about their hairstyles, in, in, um, in the Soviet Union people just saw this as, as a, as a they saw the Beatles as a um, means of choice, that you could choose a, another life. And so, uh, and then within these four stories of, the, of uh, John, Paul, George and Ringo, you also have the stories of all the other people around them, the wives and the girlfriends, the fans. I think uh, more than most books, I've, I have a lot of uh, memories of the fans and the psychological influence of the Beatles on the fans. There's meant to be a thousand Beatles books around, so uh, some might argue there was no need for a, a thousand and first. Um, but I, I wanted to do it in a kind of new way, which was slightly like uh, the same method as I'd applied to Princess Margaret in my previous book, which is a kind of weird collage of things which don't necessarily go in chronological order. So it forms a kind of little, lots of little chapters forming kind of prisms which shine light on each other. It's rather hard to explain, but I think I think it does give you a sort of sense of the uh, the kind of fun and excitement of the Beatles, and also the way that uh, the memories of the fans merge with the memories of the Beatles themselves, and then you have lots and lots of subsidiary uh, characters. I mean, like most obviously Brian Epstein and the Maharishi, but also people like I'd have a long chapter on 
Jimmy Nickel, who was uh, one of the Beatles for 10 days when Ringo uh, went ill. And uh, he went on a tour with them to uh, Scandinavia and Australia. And in a weird way, it ruined his life because he suddenly, he was in heaven and then suddenly he was taken away from heaven. And so I go into, so there are quite a lot of the, the sort of flotsam and jetsam, as you might say, that were washed up by the Beatles. Um, it, yeah, so, so it's, a, it's a kind of little jackdaw, or big jackdaw of a book. <laughs> My research, um, I could sort of boast, it did sort of span, uh, you know, America and uh, Hamburg and uh, Liverpool. Uh, but it wasn't a great slog because it's all kind of enjoyable. All those three uh, cities are great. Um, uh, uh, unbelievable amount of reading because basically anyone who's ever been associated with the Beatles has written a book. You know, so things like the uh, the Beatles hairdresser wrote quite a good book, or John Le Lennon's uh, uh, best uh, friend at school, uh, Pete Shotton, he wrote a very good book. Uh, Cynthia Lennon wrote two autobiographies. So there's an amazing, I mean, I think it's a bit like the, if you were researching the Tudors, you probably wouldn't have as much on the, the entire Tudor dynasty as you could find out about the Beatles. The trouble with the Beatles is not, um, is not finding out stuff, it's, it's getting rid of stuff that you found out. Uh, there are huge books, there are, there's a 2,000 page book which only takes them up to 1962. The, the research, I could have spent the rest of my life researching the Beatles.